Hey, this is Seth Peak with Peak Realty once again with Harry Bennett of Equity Reach Mortgage. What's going on, Harry? Hey, man, it's always always a pleasure to catch up with you on this. Yeah, we're going to talk about money today, right? We're going to talk, talk about, about money, we'll talk about some real estate, some opportunities, some pitfalls, some lawsuits. We thought we'd have like a little uh, catch up chat on some random little topics that are not as, as wide ranging today. Um, number one, you know, going into the loan amount, what goes into the loan amount when you're applying for a loan and uh, closing escrow on a home, what gets considered right. Mm -hmm. And then maybe uh, talking about how realtors uh, get paid and how lenders get paid out of the whole situation and how that might be changing for realtors here in the future. And, um, and yeah, just anything else that might crop up out of this conversation, if anything else you had on your mind, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, a frequent question that I get is what's included in my, my, my monthly payment. Right. And you know, there's, there's, a couple of different ways to go about it. Either A, are you escrowing your taxes and insurance or are you not escrowing your taxes and insurance? And then from there, you can have two different types of payments, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, most people, um, especially first time home buyers, they're, they're going to escrow those taxes and insurance. Sure. So when you're talking about what's included in my payment, it's going to be your principal, your interest, so those two pieces on a 30 year fixed mortgage will never change. That's going to be set. Mm -hmm. Your insurance, however, may change over the life of that loan. And then your taxes may gradually go up over the life of the loan. But all those are included into your um, your payment if you have it escrowed. Just to um, humor me a little bit, why would somebody not want to include their, let's say, taxes and insurance in their mortgage? Well, um, you know, say if you're putting, you know, you're 20, you're putting 20% down or 50% down, and maybe you're, you're kind of savvy with uh, taxes. Mm -hmm. And um, you decide that you want to pay your tax bill with a credit card to earn points, and then mm -hmm. you're going to pay off the credit card. I've had people literally say I do it for the points for the miles. Um they sometimes they feel a little bit more in control with right. um, you know their monthly payment because the monthly payment is higher. If you escrow everything, you're you're still paying the same amount for the the year no matter what. Right. However, your monthly payment is is higher because you're including it instead of having this big chunk of a payment come out twice a year for your. And taxes. are you accruing like interest? Insurance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some people want to play with that money. They want to, you know, do, you know, put it in little investment vehicles or or whatnot. So, or just the points again. Um, and then the same thing with with insurance. Um, they could just make one, you know, quick phone call, which you can still do anyways when you're just because your insurance is escrowed, and we close with that insurance. It mm -hmm. does not mean they have to be. It has to be that policy. You still have to have insurance right on the property, right? Because or else. The more the the mortgage company is going to force insurance and it's going to be For super sure. expensive. Yeah. But um, but you could still shop around and, and change insurance companies later on if 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 you find you're if you're not happy with with that current provider. I mean, I don't want to get too far into the weeds with that, but you know, we've had clients that have uh, needed insurance like on the, in the during the witching hour of closing escrow, right? <laughs> and they're like, "We're going to get yeah. this. This is super expensive." But then the week after they close escrow, they start shopping around for a better policy. I mean. It's kind right. of like you you need it you need it to you need it to close escrow and fund the loan. Yep, but, I had that happen to me as well. Uh, we had a client that was buying in a, in a certain location here on the Central Coast, and uh, we had to move. That what ended up happening is the the close of escrow date went up earlier, mm -hmm. and uh, um, that was going to mess with that current policy. So they ended up canceling that policy and then going with a different policy, which increased their uh, their monthly payment by about 20 bucks. Um, so it's not a big deal, but the most important thing is on a, on a purchase is that you're meeting those deadlines no matter what. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And how, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of in this position now in a current, in a current situation where the lender is brought in like later on, like too late, almost like it's at the, like I said, like, like the witching hour again, where the lender is all of a sudden coming in and that kind of goes to, um, the thing of a previous video where it's like you having every all your ducks in a row and we're the seller, but you know, the buyer is um their clients are are, are a little bit lagging on on securing the right lender uh going into the deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having all that lined out and just being totally dialed in on what all their costs are gonna be could keep this deal from falling out of escrow, right? 
Oh, it's, absolutely. Yeah. If, if they've had a, a long-standing relationship with their lender, they've been working with that lender for the past maybe five, six, seven months. Right. Um, my heart would say, you know, trust that 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 lender. If you feel like you're getting the adequate service, right? right. If you're not satisfied with the service and you're calling and you're left with questions unanswered, I'll get back to you. And then they don't get back to you. Uh, this is a problem uh, in, in lending. And that's what makes each mortgage company different to, because it's only as good as their people, right? right? I'm only, you know, like equity reaches, you know, only as good as, as the people we hire. Uh, Cesslock, same thing, or Loan Depot, or any of these other companies are only good as the people that you put in, in place. For sure. So um, if you have a you know unique situation um, that needs a little bit more attention, then, you know, you want to factor that in because what you don't want at the end of the day is, you know, everyone's going to get, you know, quotes on, on rates and you can quote it all out, but it doesn't mean that it's always going to close. So that's right. the biggest distinction is, is, is quoting, but then also, <laughs> am I approved for this? And then is it going to close? Am I going to be funding, especially on a purchase transaction? You've got multiple families, right? Right. That are, one's moving out, one's moving in. They need to buy this house over here. So you've got a lot of, a lot of at stake. Yeah. I mean, in terms of the cost too, you know, most of the time, I mean, all the time mm -hmm. you're dealing with buyers, right? You know, you're a lender, but you know, yeah. when it comes to like part of the, part of the cost right now, doesn't include a commission to um, a buyer's agent, right? And it's kind of wanted to lead into my next the, the next topic I wanted to talk about was, you know, we we get paid if we're the buyer or the seller's agent, we're getting paid uh, the commissions agreed upon by the seller's agent and the seller, right? It's part of the part of the listing agreement. And sometimes right. you have a buyer where if the if the commission is stated on the MLS, it's like commissions 2% or something a little bit on the lower end. Sometimes a good okay. buyer's agent that's really popular, that's really, you know, good and, and or has a good, um, good foundation could say, well, okay, to the buyer, well, they're offering 2% to me, but I, I charge two and a half. So then the buyer would have to make up the extra half a percent. Have you ever seen that before? Where the I actually, agent? I have. Yeah. One so that's time. And That's I've never seen it before. And uh, <laughs> and we're, it almost caught me off guard. But yeah, I have seen it where the, the buyer's agent actually charged the 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 client that they're representing. Yeah. So that it's happening. So in the in the realtor, like, um, you know, media circles or like uh, national like channels that you see like Facebook or in, in like conferences and stuff, we're now talking a lot more buyer's agents are talking about uh, making up that difference to get the dollar amount that they... Um, that they that they want because sometimes the seller's agent mm -hmm. is going to say okay it's five percent it's gonna be three percent to me and then two percent to the buyer's agent right or it's six percent right. it's going to be three and a half and two and a half right so this the buyers it's it's a way for the buyer's agent to say like this is what i'm worth and this is what this is how i what i do to get you the right home this is my negotiating power and so that difference is going to be coming out of the loan most you know so it's it's not always known if the buyer's going to like, that's not a known variable on your end in the beginning mm -hmm. when you're pre-qualifying somebody that extra cost, uh, that extra. Yeah. That would be a closing cost. Yeah. Right. Right. But you know, we're talking about like how realtors get paid and what's top of mind for me right now is this uh, lawsuit with the national association of realtors, basically saying that uh, it's an antitrust suit saying that buyers and sellers should pay separately the lawsuit is that you know they want they want the buyers agents and the sellers agents to be paid by their prospective parties um okay this is this is a kind of a big deal uh because realtors are going to have to uh be competing with each other for buyers which is a lot bigger of a pool and usually you're going to have more of a competition uh with buyers um than sellers with especially with inventory so low so it's the worry is it's going to be a race to the bottom with Realtor saying, well, I'll only charge you half a percent or I'll charge you a flat fee. You're talking about like these big online platforms doing flat fee uh, representation for like whatever, $500, $1,000. Okay. I mean, even yeah. most houses around here, $5,000 would be a bargain, right? You know, usually, uh, you know, if you're like at an $800,000 price point, that's a bargain if that's mm -hmm. all you had to pay your buyer's agent. But when it right. comes to like lending, if this passes, then you're, or this, this court case goes in favor of the, uh, the plaintiff, 
the bu- the buyer is going to have to come up with an extra around here up to twenty thousand dollars to to pay their Maybe. buyer's agent if it's two percent two and a half percent, especially with the right. median home prices around here. So how do you and foresee that the, playing yeah. out? Have you gave that much thought? Oh, man. Um, I haven't really given that much thought, to be honest with you, until they, you know, say this is the way we're going to change the, the <laughs> this is the new rules, right? So, because I, because I, that that would that would be a big disruptor in, into you know real estate, because right now you know buyers when when they're going out shopping at a home, you know they meet you at like you you meet your realtor at an open house maybe, right? Yeah. And they provide a lot of value, a lot of service, you know, and at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you're, you're not really paying them separately out fr- up front for that service. Right. Mm-hmm. It's they, they only get paid when the, when the deal closes, right. right. Just like uh, us on the lending institution, we only get compensated, right. Mm-hmm. If the loan funds. Right. And so if it does not fund, then the lending institution does not get any type of, you know, um, you know, get to keep any money. There's no contract that you sign with me that says, oh, if this doesn't fund, you're going to pay, you know, $3,000. Right. Right. So, you know, if, if that, if that happens where buyers have to come in with extra money to be well represented, I mean, the way I look at it is that if you don't, if you're not going to come in with this extra money, right. If you're, if you have to come in with this extra money to be represented, well, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have a lot of buyers that are going to opt not to be represented. Okay. Right. And then that is like going, you know, to court, uh, for your first time or something. And, you know, you don't have any legal representation, not, not saying that attorney is the same value of a real estate agent, but honestly, when you're, you're buying your first home, you're putting ten, fifteen thousand dollars down. Mm-hmm. That's going to be at risk. That's a big risk to go into something and really not know anything about or or the the rules of the game, right? You're going to be coached and and coursed by the selling agent, uh, you know, for the listing agent, and then they're going to just you know wrap you around a tree. <laughs> Well, yeah. And you're also going to see a lot of like what I would consider to be antitrust. You know, when you have like double ending a deal, like the seller's also representing the buyer, it can always be kind of sticky. Sometimes the seller, like the actual seller of the home would tell a seller's agent, I don't want you to put in the agreement that I don't want you to bring the buyer. Um, Like, I don't, I don't want it to be double represented. Right. I've seen that before Uh, recently, you know, another realtor said, if I find, um, I might have a buyer, but I'm the listing agent, so I can't represent them for my client's wishes on the contract. But what we don't have currently, most of the time, I mean, I've never heard anybody really doing it. I mean, I've never done it, is to have a buyer's agency agreement. So you have like a seller's, uh, like a listing agreement that expires in six months, three months, six months, a year. But nobody really signs a buyer's agency like agreement. And what that would be was like, hey, you know, for six months, I am your realtor. And if you yeah, buy I've anything without me, you know, you're, you're, you're breaking the law, you know, you're, or, you're, uh, you're breaking, tax, you're so, breaking yeah. contract. Uh, yeah. And so then I, you can go and, you know, sue for the, whatever the commission is due you, but like, even still, like that's going to be, I just think it would be a very big game changer in terms of uh, promoting more of like an AI cloud-based brokerages that are going to be like, Hey, we'll just do it for X amount of dollars. Uh, you don't have to get into a contract with a realtor for six months. And uh, I just think uh, it's going to be interesting how it goes that, for sure. I mean, honestly, you you bring that up and that could be a very real thing, you know, where AI starts coming in and, and asks it questions, you know, the, mm-hmm. the, the client, like, Hey, what would you like to offer that? And yeah. it automatically computes, sends it in. Um, and then you'll, you'll lose that touch, right. Of a, of an actual professional. I think right. that's the difference, right? These tools are great and they can do a lot of really nice things, but at the end of the day, um, the computer is not going to hold your hand. It's only as good as what you told it to do. Right. The input, right. What's yeah. on the internet already is what it knows basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, with, with commission being paid out by the buyer, I think the buyers are going to be shopping. The consumer is going to go, I'm going to want to spend less money as much as possible, especially a lower like tier, you know, someone who's buying something at a lower rate that wants to save every penny they can. Yeah. It's going to make, it's going to grow the gap 
of of buying your first home even mm-hmm. even larger right yeah. you're gonna if that passes i feel that there's going to that 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 bridge is going to get wider and you're going to have some people that maybe cannot uh, afford now to buy a home because now instead of coming in with maybe five six or seven percent now they're looking at eight or nine to close the deal right or buyer's agency is just going to become something that's more of like a like a commodity that's just going to drive down the price because you know a lot of realtors might get out of it they're like i'm not making any money as a buyer's agent uh listing agency is going to be you know like gold having listings is going to be like gold but uh I mean, that's what they they already are, right? So listings. Or maybe that it all but, shifts over, yeah. right? And then when you sign a listing agreement for, you know, 5%, you know, you are going to list it as maybe the whole thing get changed. And, and then you are in control of, of representing the buyer and the seller. And that's just the way it has to be from now on. Right. I think there's a couple of countries that might be like that. Still, I'm not sure. <laughs> where you, <laughs> be a... They basically do both. But uh, anyway, I, I just thought it was pretty interesting, you know, from what I hear and what I read, it's not really going like, it's not really going like obviously in favor of NAR. You know, it's it's not obvious that NAR is going to win this uh, defense, right? So we kind of just have to plan for it and see what happens. But it might just mean that buyers' commissions are are going to be lower in the future. You know, but man, getting be- under contract with the buyers to say, you know, you know, we're being we're being told like in our in our coaching groups and stuff that you know, start like looking at buyers agreements now and, you know, pitching to how it secures them and it secures you from offering the best service. If you're an exclusive uh, agency for their, yeah. for their buying and kind of getting into the practice of talking about that, because we're here for the client's best interest. We want to make sure that they're getting the best deal no matter what. And if we're, yep. if we're the buyer's agent, like we're, the the commission right now is already set. You know, we're yeah. being told, okay, it's one mm-hmm. and a half. That's really low. It's two and a half. It's three. That's really good. You know, but we're we're not going to go and personally treat the deal any differently if it's a half a percent different. So the way it is now is a you know, it's as a buyer's agent, it's not you know, you're getting us one hundred percent. Like you're getting the peak team one hundred percent if we're your buyer uh, buyer representation, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that comes from like a, an ethic standpoint that, you know, that you, you and your wife have, right. Mm-hmm. You know, if th- that not everyone will be equal to that, right. There's going to be some people that are like, Oh, I'm, I'm only getting 1%. You know, I'll take that call on Monday. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, that, that'd be a, a very interesting dynamic. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, you know, you, w- like when I first was buying a home, right? When I, when I peel the onion back and I go at my core, when I was first looking at homes, um, I didn't start with a pre-approval. I didn't start with a lender. Um, I just went to an open house and just cause I just wanted to go see what was it all about. Right. And just, you know, talk. And so, you know, it had like my, my agent said, Hey, um, here's this buyer's agreement, right? And basically it's going to solidify us as a team. And it's going to make sure that my work at the end of the day, isn't all for nothing. And it has a time frame to it, but I want you to sign it because I want to be committed. We're committed to each other. And I want to, you know, do all, all things I can. I, I would have, I would have signed it. Right. right because right. I wouldn't have want him to do all this work or her do all this work. And then we go, yeah, I'm going to go this way. That's just not me. Yeah. Not me. Right. So um, I, I wouldn't have a problem signing it, but if I had to come in with 2% on top of that, that's going to be a tough conversation for tons of people. And I'm sure there's going to be great strategies that agents are going to produce and say, you know what, there's two, 3% I can see off of this sales price, right? There's right. two or three percent. I can see us getting back out of the transaction to cover that, you know, one and a half or 2% that I'm charging you separately, plus to get you an extra one and a half to help with their closing costs. That's thinking creative. Right. Yeah. Negotiating. Yeah. Down to negotiating. And that's what that, and I mean, you're, you're going to see negotiations go out the roof with that yeah. kind of stuff. Right. Cause that's, that, right. I'm sure that's going to be the, the focal point is now you're going to see 
those asking prices are okay. We'll, we'll come at your asking. However, I want 3% coming back to my buyer to cover my 2% and also 1% for their closing costs, just for the mm-hmm. trouble, you know, or whatever. Right. Right. I mean, it'll be a competitive market for sure. Yeah, we shall see. But for the time <laughs> being, you know, status quo, just keep doing what we're doing. Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and what are you seeing right now as far as uh, inventory levels on the central coast? Low low but you know here's the thing buyers buyers are not um the number of buyers are low too but the inventory is low so the prices are just you know they're not the price isn't going down it's just disinflating it's not deflating it's disinflating it's just slowing down the inflation rate right yeah it's going backwards a little bit but it's not it's not getting cheaper it's just remaining maintaining the what it is i think like you know a few weeks median um a few weeks on the market is like normal for the normal houses. I think it's like uh, 30 to 40 days on the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like the median amount of time it's taking to sell a house. There's less buyers, you know, you know, and like we talked about before we got on here, there's less first time home buyers. I mean, there's almost pretty much non-existent at this, at this moment. Uh, I mean, you could say here and there, but not like it's, you know, your average person, if they're uber wealthy and they're bit, like Silicon Valley or they're 25 years old and they're buying a house for the first time, it's different than if it's a, a you know, a blue collar family looking to buy a house or an entry level home here in the County. It's mm. pretty much non-existent. Wouldn't you say so? Yeah. 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 It's- and, but investment properties, second houses, um, you know, upgrading people that can afford to upgrade We're you know, we're still seeing that. Right. Right. You know, uh, things that cash flow things that you can write off a lot more like an Airbnb or uh, stuff like that. I mean, you're, you're seeing a little bit more activity, uh, duplexes, multifamily. It's, it's hard to cash flow here. I will say um, yeah. I had several investors that I talked to and uh, when we break out the numbers together, um, you know, I mean, they have the investor typically has their set of numbers back here about, cap rate. OK, yeah, the cap rate. You know, what am I going to get on this property if I want to sell this in three years or, you know, 10 years? Um, and so go ahead. I was going to say the cap, the cap rate is interesting because they're like there's certain golden rules and numbers that each investor has and certain like verbiage that they go by and like certain things that they're like non-negotiable has four and a half is the lowest cap rate I'll do or whatever. But there's some areas, you know, I was talking to uh, my coach, Patrick, you know, someone in Hollywood, their cap rate might be two and a half percent, but they don't care as an investor. They just, if they own a house or a, a, a property on Melrose or somewhere, in, it's more of a status thing to an investor. Like this is something I have. So down the road, I can sell it for, it doesn't matter if it cash flows now, right. but it's just going to be worth so much down the road when I sell it. Right. Yeah. So it's the same here. Like, um, like for instance, now, you know, end of September, we have a couple Airbnbs for sale in, in Cayucas, you know, the cash flow is not maybe as high as an Airbnb that's, um, like in an, another area just because of the price point to get into it and what you can rent it for versus Huntington beach or something. Mm. It's still, the number could be relatively depending on the person, a lower cap rate. Uh, these are like around 4.2 to 4.5%. If the if the buyer is going to use it as a vacation home and they're going to rent it out Airbnb, the lower the cap rate is not a big of a deal. That's you know, big, yeah, right. If they're breaking even on their Airbnb in order to have a vacation home, they can go to for two months a year. Then right. what does it matter really? So it matters on it like itself almost. Yeah, what type of investment property you're buying? Are you wanting maximum cash and it's just a property that's part of your inventory, or if it's going to be, uh, you know, a vacation, a part time vacation home for you as well. Yeah, that's that's very good. Um, you know, keeping the perspective open because a lot of people just figure, okay, cash flow, cash flow, and it's really it's not all cash flow. Like like in you know, I mean, how I would look at it, I, if if it was me and I was the investor, I would really be looking at cash flow, right? Because mm-hmm. I want more monthly income, right? Um, you know, and so that's where it comes to a really good conversation. It's like, okay, what are you really? What's your goal? Uh huh. Are you really looking for um, a large cash flow? It may not be here on the Central Coast, right? To have a very, very large cash flow. Um, um, But again, it could be on the Airbnb side where you're like, hey, 
the cash flow on this property, right? So even if you pay for it in cash, you know, you're going to get maybe 3,500 bucks a month. However, if you did the Airbnb, which you have the experience of Airbnb uh -huh. and you know, you're based on your, your expertise and knowledge, you could say, Hey, this is probably going to be maybe at eight or $9,000 a month mm -hmm. if you do it this way. Right. So there's always different ways of splitting the, you know, of, of, of shaving the cat down, I guess. Right. But yeah. Um, you know, that's where it's, you have to get super creative in these type of environments, these markets where um, the prices are high, interest rates are high, right? I mean, it's it's the highest we've, we've been in the last, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, so you, you really look back and you're just like, oh my gosh, like the the, the increase, you know, the, how mm -hmm. fast it's, it's been jumping up and still even today, housing is hot, right? Yeah. Prices are still up there. Um, regardless of, of even where the rates going at today. So, although if you, if you go on the MLS and there's a lot more, there's a lot more price decreases when you filter it out than, than a year and a, a year and a half ago. I mean, there's like, if you filter out price decrease, the Tascadero is just like this laundry list of the past week, but mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot different than it used to be for sure. The yeah. Airbnbs are like short-term rental. If we just use like Airbnb is just, you know, it's easier to say, but the short-term rental uh, just the amount of like tax, you know, the write-offs you get with it as well. It just it can make sense to somebody who's not necessarily looking for as much cash flow. In in Caicos, if you're not like on the ocean, you're probably getting like if it's a well well run Airbnb, you're probably making like maybe four and a half to seven thousand a month. Slow season, four and a half. You know, you're probably getting two hundred and fifty bucks a night for like a three bedroom house that's not right on the ocean. Mm. And it's, and so if you're buying a house for 1.2 million, you know, and you're, you're making like upwards to maybe $6,000 uh, a month, $7,000 during peak season on the house. Um, I mean, you do the math. It, like you said, it's not like, oh my God, we got to get into this. This is like, <laughs> this is like a booming industry, but right. it's, um, we find, we find that the people that invest in them more are folks that um, come to the area and like to use them as well. So it's almost like a house hack for their second yeah, home. Yeah, now that would be a great, yeah, that's a yeah. great safe spot to park your money in, right? If you're buying cash or even if you're having a small, you know, loan on on that property, yeah. certainly 1.2 financing and you're putting maybe 20% down, yeah. you're not going to be cash flowing mm -hmm. on that $6,000 a month income, right? But if right. you're using it, like I said, as a house, house hack where you're, hey, you know, we're going to enjoy this, this property here on the coast of the family. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to enjoy it maybe three, three months out of the year, two months out of the year. And then the rest of the time we're going to, you know, maybe rent it out a little bit, make some income. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great safe, you know, investment, you know, in my yeah. eyes, that'd be a great, you know, a great uh, um, use of those funds. You're looking at it through a different lens. And let me ask you on the decrease for a Tascadero, um, what's the percentages that they're de decreasing? Do you know? Uh, I mean, most of them, if you, I mean, if you're just asking me off the top of my head, you're looking yeah. at like five to $20,000 decreases. So it's, it's not like they're not vast, but they're, they're incrementally coming down like chink, 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 chink. Like if the ones that aren't selling is it month over month, it's going down or is it just mostly, I don't have, I don't have that. I couldn't say exactly. Like, I don't want to just Act like arbitrarily I know something. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I'm just thinking like, is it like one percent? Because some people they hear decreases, they go like, "There's my time to snag." And really, if it's if it's you know twenty thousand bucks, right? Um, that's roughly a you know a uh, hundred hundred dollar payment or something like that, right? Yeah. A month. Um, you know, but if it's if it's five thousand bucks, it's really not going to you know move the needle too much at face value. It appears that a lot of the houses that are listed for more than I think that they're worth right now, the more that the market can bear right now, this people were thinking, oh, the summer we're kicking up a little bit, even though the interest rates are high, houses are ticking yeah. up in May. The houses that went on the market in like August right now, they're, the you know, it's going into the fall. They maybe right. priced them like it was May. They're pricing them like late spring pricing and they're starting to decrease now. And so it's just a matter of like people thinking that, you know, we had a little bit more of a heat up this summer. Uh, we didn't have a decline, but we also just like, it just, it just seems like the market's kind of just staying still. So I really think it's just people coming to terms with, they price their house a little too high, especially in a Tascadero. You know, you and, go and from that's six to 700,000. It's such a vast difference in the home you get, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And, and that's where it's like, I really, you know, want to, you know, 
inject out to the community and, and listing agents, right? It's that, you know, if you're having a battle with the seller about where you're, you're wanting to list it at, right? You know, if they're, if they're open to seller credits versus just the reduction, you know, same with the buyers, because every buyer, you know, they say, oh, I'm trying to get, you know, $10,000 off. Um, and that's 65 bucks a month, roughly, give or take, maybe 70 or, you know, 70 bucks a month, mm -hmm. right? For every $10,000. And so it's not achieving what they're really after, which is the monthly flow, right? That right. monthly that monthly payment. Now, if they're paying in cash, certainly, by all means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you don't want to overextend yourself, but the, the property needs to come in at that value. It still needs sure. an appraisal. Right. Yes. So I think like those tactics are, are are really good, which I didn't know about when I, you know, first bought my home. I didn't know how all that worked. You know, I just kind of mm -hmm. went in there and bought it, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Well, you trusted the professional. Yeah. I, was I just was like, okay, yeah. let's just go, you know, let's just get this over with. So, yeah. It's one hard. last, one last thing that I, um, little side note on Airbnbs. And I think that, um, or short-term vacation rentals, like it's, it's it's half and half sort of the wild west uh in slow county uh with the licensing mm -hmm. you know you have areas like morro bay it's a moratorium you have parts of pismo beach where it's like free for all like in downtown right or has that changed and then you have like uh Caicus where it goes off a radius right so you can only have a certain you can have one per uh set amount of radius of, of homes so if you're like the airbnb or short-term rental in that neighborhood nobody can have it within a certain parameter of that, of that building. It's okay. not like a lottery, whereas Cambria is like, you get one and then you can sell it and you can transfer it to another property, but you can sell it for whatever you want. You know, I've heard people sell their vacation rental license for like 10,000 bucks, 20,000 bucks. No way. Like, I don't want to do okay. it anymore, but this person wants it. So I'll sell it to you. You know, we've had that happen. And you can just transfer it over to another property. Right. Whereas in Cayucas, you don't transfer the license. You actually start and stop the license at the same day before anybody else can. It's like kind of like a, you go, uh, I'm canceling my license. The next person goes, I'm applying for my license. Like, right. And then they start a new one. Okay. So it's, it's almost a, I mean, they'd have to know exactly. Someone in that neighborhood would have to know the day, the moment that you're canceling it for it to like get gummed up, but it's a little bit trickier. So each like town, like a Tascadero has no restrictions on short-term rentals because we're not impacted by them. We don't have a plethora of short-term rentals in a Tascadero. It's not really like a destination city for people to rent a whole home out, you know, but we do have them, you know, but um, Paso Robles has, there's a cap, you know, we're done in the city limits. Right. So it's just interesting how it, it, they're different depending on the municipality or the, or the, uh, if it's an incorporated town within the county which like kaika says it has a weird rule or los osos would have a similar thing yeah. so when you're looking to buy like a short-term vacation rental <clears throat> uh it's it's really important to like figure out like what does that town or community or municipality like require and how is that license transferable or how does mm -hmm. it transfer because you're going to need to know that like when you get into it we get that question all the time especially on these houses in kaika really it's like yeah. how does it transfer it doesn't you cancel and start it like immediately. That's great. Like, yeah. Both. I mean, and, and see like that little bit of information right there would save somebody hours, you know, of, of trying to research that. And you just, you just know it right off the bat. Mm -hmm. Do you have any properties recently that you've listed that, you know, is, is a vacation rental that you want to kind of maybe show showcase or is there anything that's coming up? Well, yeah. I mean, if someone's watching this video, like right now, we have two in Caicos, um, 3191 and 3441 Ocean Boulevard. And they're both across on the east side of uh, the one. They're both licensed vacation rentals and they both cash flow, uh, you know, depending on Are how much you right... put into it. Yeah. Yeah. Are they right next to each other? or uh, like... They're two blocks away. So we have three 3400 block and 3100 block of Ocean Boulevard. One's a two unit. So you can rent out uh, nice. which is cool because you can have two rentals or you can have one big sleeps 10 rented for more. And then the other one's a, a three bedroom. Um, but they've both been active for, for a couple of years as vacation rentals. Uh, we've been managing them, uh, for a couple of years for the, for the sellers. And so they're listed for sale Let's see which one goes first. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, if you go back the, I think the last video, before this one that's published is a video tour of one of them. And I'll be publishing another video tour of the other one tomorrow or Friday yeah. uh, just to kind of see what they're all about. But 
Ocean hey, views, see, right? Yeah, ocean views from the balcony. It's on the east side of the one. So it's you don't have any foot traffic, like beach foot traffic, which is a plus. Yeah. Um, it's going to be half the price as uh, as the west side of the one. You know, you have some houses on the cliff that are like six million, five million, four to six million dollars. Uh, so if you're on the other side of the of the one, you're in like the one to two million dollar range most of the time. Okay. Uh, maybe as low as eight hundred, nine hundred thousand if it's a fixer upper. Do you get a lot of people that call you? Um, like for instance, I'll, I'll have people that are from Laguna Beach, yeah, you know, or Newport or San Francisco, and then they they come down here and they they see this these prices at 1.2 and they're yeah. like oh that's sweet you know and they just gobble it up with cash you know it's like dang barely gave us a, a chance down here but i mean are you seeing a lot of that not so much uh personally also with investment someone's making an investment uh they also see oh wow 1.2 and then they're like well how much could i rent it for long-term rental it's like okay maybe 4200 bucks or you yeah. know they're not like they're not like oh because like you go to San Diego, like a basic single family residence in a suburb is going to be like $4,000 a month to rent. Yeah. So you're not getting like the, the investment doesn't, even though the, the price is lower, but the rents are lower. So, but if it's someone's coming here and they're transfer, like we see it a lot from like the Bay area or LA moving to North County, like wine country. And they're getting these like two acres with like a 3000 square foot house for like 1.1 million little of a fixer upper but they're going, Holy smokes, you know, they could sell their house for $3 million in the Bay or two and a half million dollars. And it's like, they're getting a major upgrade. Uh, so we see a lot more of that seems like in North County, uh, the, the, the coast is more, the people that we run across, it's more of second homes. You know, it's usually their vacation home or they're looking for a second home or they're looking for an investment property. Um, but we did have that sale, um, on Los Osos Valley road on Pecho. Oh yeah, uh, that. and that was um, that was sold to a, a a lovely couple from from Orange County. So every uh, once in a while, but personally, not so much. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember actually at that one, there was a few people that did stop by from Orange County, so maybe it was one of them that uh, ended up yeah. buying. That's one of those houses where it's like um, it's also like uh, when you're it's right next to a state park. So people during the open house were maybe going to go, they're exploring the area. They're like, let's yeah. go in there and check it out. They're from out of town. Right. Or their kid goes to Cal Poly. Uh, the few, the few uh, times we've done a sale in Osos the past couple of years. Um, I think they've all been from out of town, actually. Come to think of it, either the Bay area, Sacramento or, or Orange County. So if you're seeing this from Orange County or the Bay, you got to contact Seth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We know how to we know how to save you some money and get and get you an upgrade here on the Central Coast. It's definitely an upgrade of life. You know, we're looking to help people like live wonderfully on the Central Coast. Um, oh, it says right there on our poster, right? It's like that's that's our motto is like how can we help you rock and roll? And we partner with uh folks like Harry Bennett and Equity Reach Mortgage Team. Uh, they're gonna get it done. They're gonna they're gonna work just as hard as we are to help you out. Oh, absolutely, and that's that's a part of the whole you know lender and realtor team. And you know, we uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity to to help out and you know want to get the solutions and get you in there and move along. Well, we're gonna we're gonna head out now and uh, looking forward to our next chat next week yeah, and um, coming up with some more topics. There, there's a. There's, it's always fun coming up with topics. It's not easy. So if you have any topics, you haven't been watching this video and you want to leave it in the comments, we'd be happy to address them on our next video. Thanks a lot, Harry. I'll chat right, with you man. later, man. Take care.